All right, you're listening to The Soapbox on WMPG. I'm your host, Eric Poulin. My guest once again is Owen Hill. He is an activist and organizer for the uh, 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 International Socialist Organization. Um, so, Owen, let me ask you this. is Do you think, what, what's your read on whether or not there is truly an appetite right now in America for the type of radical change uh, that, that you're calling for? Is it your sense that, you know, people kind of stop at reforming the existing electoral system Mm -hmm. through like a Bernie Sanders character? Uh, And so we still need to take some steps to get to where you're talking Mm -hmm. about. Or or do you think that the disenchantment, the frustration that is really, I mean, is rampant and Mm -hmm. is clear all throughout society. Do you think that uh, it has primed people for the kind of revolutionary change that you're talking about, which is mm-hmm. even more revolutionary than Sanders is talking mm-hmm. about, certainly. Yeah, no, I'm. <laughs> it'd be nice if it, we were in the throes <laughs> of the revolution, <laughs> and you know, tomorrow, tomorrow, socialism and onwards and upwards. But you know, I think we have to take a realistic view, a long view, and we have to say that most people still see, um, most people want serious change and are willing to work for serious change, um, but then have stri- have a strategies for their strategies for how to get there i think aren't fully formed or aren't aren't strategies that are fully equipped to win mm-hmm. um and i think sanders is a good example of that you know it's not just sanders radical populism that's attracting people it's also his strategy of trying to take over the democratic party um that that people still see that strategy as a viable strategy and one that they want to participate in um and that's great you know people should people should participate in the strategies to change the world that they think will work and then they should think about how it went and they should assess it and they should assess the challenges that they faced um their what they what went well what was hard um and then they should think more about what strategies do we need and what strategies will will take us forward i think the most exciting thing is that people are actually attempting their strategies Mm -hmm. right now which is different than what it was in the 2000s or you know, definitely in the 2000s when I became political. Like, I just think people aren't, in the 2000s, people's strategies for change were like, drop out, <laughs> you know, or change will never happen, you yeah, know, yeah. Uh, or j- vote for John Kerry, call me sir, John Kerry, and he'll end the, <laughs> he'll end the war. Yeah, well, um, you know, my, I've made the argument, uh, and tell me what you think of it, that, you know, the Bernie Sanders thing, this moment is really... Uh, a good thing for the left, however it shakes out, because I think for a long time, the left has justifiably and rightly been very critical of the Democratic National Committee and the Democratic Party as a whole, uh, particularly the the new Democratic movement Mm -hmm. ushered in by Clinton Mm -hmm. and the Clintons. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, so, but, but, but then again, Sanders is openly sort of hostile to the DNC. I mean, he's butted heads with them quite a bit and it seems pretty clear that they're threatened by mm-hmm. him um and the establishment really across the board in both parties is feeling uh somewhat threatened mm-hmm. uh, so it seems to me that either he wins you know and and is f- forces change onto the democratic party which and and effectively you know disrupts the dnc as it currently exists which would be a good thing um or if we push hard enough for him to win the the enough democratically elected delegates to win the nomination you know the other the other argument uh on the left is well the super delegates are are going to not going to hand it to uh Sanders even if he wins the democratic mm-hmm. uh, democratically elected delegates uh, they're going to give it to Clinton well if that happens i really think that they would be exposing just how undemocratic mm-hmm. they are as a party and the the, sh- the curtain would come down and people would l- leave in droves the democratic party which would also be a mm-hmm. great thing let's mm-hmm. face it um <laughs> So uh, is, is, that, is it your sense also that this is really, however it shakes out, a good thing for the left? I mean, obviously with other things coming behind it. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I think the thing to, to, to say is that this, however this thing shakes out, this would be a very, very good thing for the left as long as we keep our heads on our, on our shoulders. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as long as we keep history as our guide, um, as long as we make patient arguments with people about strategies for how it's going to win, um, and I think as long as we, you know, still remain firm on the question of the Democratic Party, I think 
one of the things that's the challenge of this moment is that I think a lot of the left has decided to try out the strategy of trying to take over the Democratic Party. Um, I think that's a mistake. I think that's a strategy that won't work. By all means, we should be engaging with the people who are trying that strategy, talking to them, in conversation with them, with an understanding that we are on the same side, that we are working together to fight for, yes, a political revolution, yes, $15 an hour, yes, unions, yes, you know, education, health care, hell yeah. <laughs> um, you know, but like, we we also, we need to keep our heads on straight. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and I think that the thing to just keep in mind, you know, is that what the DNC decides to do with its superdelegates or what the superdelegates as a block decide to do, I think largely depends on what they think is going to be their their least worst, worst option. Because I think uh, a very them deciding a tie in favor of Clinton would be a very dangerous thing for them to do. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they'd be willing to do it. Uh, but I think they'd also be willing to let Sanders, you know, be the presidential candidate, um, you know, as long as they feel like, he is, quote unquote, serious enough, uh, as long as they feel that he's moved in the correct direction or that he's going to be able to he's going to be working with them on the key things that they see as like crucial um, and not giving ground on, on on other issues. You know, I think that they would be they might be willing to do that. We'll see how things shake out, you know, with still a long way to go till mm. July. But um, but yeah, I think that either one could happen. But the, the thing is, we need to remember is that the Democratic Party ultimately is is a tool of the one percent um it's a tool uh, of the billionaire class it's one of their two parties um you know they staff it you know they fund it <laughs> um they give the top level administrators uh jobs after they come out uh, of of you know washington um and so we just need to keep that in mind and and be able to see through what they're doing whatever they end up doing um and just continue to make the patient argument that like what's really going to deliver the change we want is mass movements yeah, I agree 100%. I, w- I would also point out, though, that the Democratic Party has not always been a tool of the 1%, arguably. I, mean, I would disagree. You would? Okay. I would disagree. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I would say, you know, you go back to the founding of the Democratic Party. Um, what was the base of the Democratic Party was the slaveholding class right. in the South. Um, you know, that was the base of the Democratic Party. It was synonymous with Klan rule. Um, in the South. Um, but then you move up to the to the most popular period of the Democratic Party, right? The 1930s, the time when the modern Democratic Party really emerges. And FDR it, welcomed the hatred of the economic royalists. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah, this yeah. was when he was still a tool of the yep. 1%? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, he, he played a crucial role in saving capitalism from itself. And he did that with the backing and support of a huge number of very, very wealthy industrialists who said, we need some peace. <laughs> we need some labor peace because mm-hmm. there are strikes and people are taking over their factories and like revolution was yeah, on the yeah, horizon. Yeah, exactly. Real this revolution. is dangerous. You know, yeah. people are going to start trying to seize this stuff and, and we need to buy some labor peace. Um, and in the process, we can, you know, uh, implement a whole number of state reforms that will, you know, that were good for good for sections of, of international capital. Well, okay. So that's an interesting point. You're right. Uh, what does it say to you that the one percent in this era, in this um, uh, in this age, it, it seems to have their head so firmly buried in the sand that they can't even see the self-preservation tactics <laughs> of what happened in the New Deal era? Mm-hmm. I mean, they can't see that widening inequality and continuing um, inequality along those lines will only spell their own doom and failure I mean, because they will provoke an actual revolution if they continue down this line i'm convinced yeah i mean i think the thing is that they don't feel they have to yet mm-hmm. um that they don't feel like the moment is dangerous enough for them that they really are forced to you know you there is like i said i think there's a massive leftward shift um in in the class consciousness of ordinary americans um but that said, I think that, you know, we are still a very long way um, from where we were, where our class was in the 1930s. So the, the Sanders movement does not pose the kind of threat that you're talking about that would sufficiently make them worry about their uh, their status. You know, I think it I, you know, I think it might pose enough of a threat that they would allow him to be the nominee, mm-hmm. um, you know, which would be, you know, a victory of the movement, mm-hmm. um, you know, a victory of, of the people fighting for Sanders. Um, but, you know, that said, I don't think it. 
I don't think that it in of itself, it's dangerous enough for them to be like, all right, we just got to reverse the program. We got to stop austerity. You know, no more neoliberalism. We're going back to social social welfare state. I, I just don't think is in the cards. Because the other thing you got to remember is capitalism is much more international than it was uh, in the 1930s. Mm. It, it's a very different system with very different dynamics. You know, it's changed tremendously in the last 90 years. Um, and that, that means that the profit margins are thinner, that competition is greater, um, and that any particular nation is under increasing threat um, of other capitalist rivals um, coming up and, and undoing their power. And in particular in America, which is still the sole superpower in the world, um, you know, I think the capitalist class in America is particularly acute to that. Um, so they want to make sure that they're continuing to invest their money into guns and bombs and controlling the world uh, mm. and not, you know, put that money into, into social welfare if they can avoid it. Mm. And maybe they'll be forced to change. Hopefully they will. Um, but we got to understand that's not going to happen automatically. It's going to happen because we force it. So there was an article recently that came out. I think it was the Washington Post uh, uh, titled something like why the establishment is afraid of Bernie Sanders. And um, in the article, it pointed out that uh, why they're really afraid of him is not so much the movement and the rhetoric as much as the fact that he's only raised, I think, a thousand dollars for down ticket Democratic races, mm -hmm. whereas, you know, Hillary's raised uh, tons and tons of money for them. And so he poses a threat to the the dominance of the Democratic, you know, establishment. Um, so is it possible? I mean, the left often criticizes him as being sort of a, uh, what do they call it? A sheep herder or something for the sheep dog, a sheep dog. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Her herding progresses back into the Democratic Party. Is it possible that he's sort of a wolf in sheep's clothing within the Democratic Party and that if he were to win the nomination, I mean, if he's if he's on that fundamental level, he's not even supporting the basic structure of the Democratic Party. Uh, and yet he could still become the titular head of the Democratic Party. Is it possible that he is planning a takedown in his own mind from uh, from within? I don't think so. No, I think he... <laughs> You know, um, that'd be interesting, but I don't think that's that's what he's that's what his goals are. I think his goal is to transform the Democratic Party from within. Mm -hmm. um, I think that he wants to transform um, the Democratic Party back into its classical phase. Um, new Deal era. Yeah, yeah, New Deal era Democratic Party. I think that's his vision. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, and I think it's even like, you know, the the some of the stuff around Sweden and stuff. I think he's pulled back from. Um, pulled back from some and more and more defined his vision as like New Deal era, which again, like you said earlier, is the center right of, of mm -hmm. European politics. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's his vision and that's what he wants to do. And I think he's very earnest about doing that. Mm -hmm. Like I think most of the people who are working for his campaign, volunteering for, volunteering for his campaign, and they're very earnest about that as a strategy for social change. Um, and I think it's great that they're attempting, that it's attempting to be put into practice. Um, I don't remain convinced that, that it's going to work. Fair enough. I, you know, a criticism I, I hear regularly of uh, Sanders supporters from some folks on the left is that, you know, basically when, and they don't say if, but when Sanders fails and this moment, moment passes and he fails to get the nomination and he endorses Clinton, which he has said he will do, um, there's no sort of backup plan for his supporters other than acquiescing and supporting Clinton. Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm not so cynical. I think that the majority of the people that he's mobilizing and the arguments he's making against Clinton are not going to be so easily forgotten. Um, but let me ask you this. What is the left's alternative plan for when that happens? Uh, what are they going to do to assuage the disappointment of, uh, you know, these millions of people that Sanders has whipped up and basically has gotten ready to hand deliver to the left? Is there an organization or a movement ready to welcome these people in, in an organized kind of way? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think certainly Jill Stein's campaign um, for president nationally is making an earnest effort in that, you know, to do that. Um, she is setting herself up as the plan B for Bernie supporters. Um, you know, she is fighting for the same things and she makes it very clear that, that she is on the same side as so many of the people who are working for Bernie's campaign. Um, but again, making that strategic argument that the left isn't going to be able to take over the Democratic Party. Um, so I think Stein is setting herself up to do that. Um, you know, unfortunately, Sanders' campaign has sucked a lot of the air out mm. um, for her campaign uh, and has made it hard, I think, for her to find traction. But certainly that's starting in a small way. And again, I think we just do need to go back to like 
you know, part of the reason that the threat isn't there for the for the internet for the you know the one percent the the billionaire class, um, the capitalist class here here in America, the reason that the threat. To, for them to deliver mass social programs isn't there yet is also because we have one of the historically weakest lefts that have ever existed in this country. You know, not since the 19th century mm-hmm. has the left been as weak as it has been for the last 5, 10, 15 years. Um, and that's a rem- that's a tremendous obstacle. Um, then that needs to be rebuilt. So people need to join the left. Mm-hmm. Um, people need to take that seriously. All right, so now you're a member of the International Socialist Organization. So let's put this into international context. Do you see a wave of uh, left-leaning um, politics around the world with Syriza, with mm-hmm. Podemos, with Jeremy Corbyn. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, e- even the Arab Spring to a yeah. certain extent, yep. you know, uh, and then Occupy Wall Street, Black Lives Matter, all the. Are, are you seeing a swell, uh, an upswell around the planet in opposition to capitalism? Is that what's going on? Yeah, I think that it's um, that it's mixed. I think, but. I think that the, the, the reality of austerity, the reality of the economic crisis is what's driving these movements. You know, you said the Arab Spring. I think the Arab Spring is a great example. It's like, I think there's an image that we have in the West of like, oh, like it was just about getting rid of the dictator. It was just about democracy. I think it's much more useful to talk about the Arab Spring in a context of declining living standards mm-hmm. and rising mm-hmm. working class fights, um, especially in Egypt, um, uh, you know, in you know, four working class living standards, strikes, major protests, um, those kinds of things. I think those were part of some of the fuel that then was underlying. And those haven't been resolved. And they, I would I would make the case also that they were rebelling against an oligarchic rule that uh, led to inequality, mm-hmm. kept the spoils of uh, the, the wealth of their their countries at the top and did not disseminate them in any anything resembling right. egalitarianism. Right. Yeah, absolutely. But the thing that's I think that's been such a challenge in the Arab Spring is that, you know, those dictators were removed and then but the, that blockage, you know, that inequality hasn't been resolved. It's actually right. it's still stayed at the top, even though the dictator was was, you know, Mubarak was removed. They succeed, they won that, which is huge, um, you know, that hasn't solved the fundamental issues. So, again, I think it goes back to then, like, what's it actually going to take to do that? And that's the thing, like, you know, like you look at all these, you know, the international swell, because I think you're right. There's an international swell of working class people trying to fight for what's right, for fight for fairness, equality, justice and human dignity uh, all across the world. But there are so many obstacles, and they, people keep well, running into Syriza barriers. Well, look at Syriza is a great example. I yeah. mean, th- you know, they were elected with huge support, uh, with a ver- very leftist, you know, political party, mm-hmm. huge support from uh, from the people, and they have been just destroyed by international bankers. I mean, yeah. they've been quashed and completely co-opted. And in some ways, you know, I think the right wing of Syriza gave up the ghost. They, you know, mm. they they didn't put the they didn't go fight in the way that I think they should have. Um, I think that why, they, now why not? Is there is there some um, what is it about capitalism that is so systemically deep that it can't even let a democratically uh, I mean a, a <laughs> widely popular democratically elected party like that do something for the country? Right, because and I think Greece had to be made an example of. Mm. Um, you know, I think the that they wanted to do what. You know what Nancy Pelosi did when she was talking about Bernie's health care package. It's like, what's the point of talking about something that's never, ever going to happen? Right. <laughs> like, get back in your place. <laughs> you are never going to eat. This world is never going to be any different. We have profit b- margins that need to be maintained. We have a bottom line to worry about. And your health is not on that line. And well, and, that, and see, and that's where protests to me is important. Mm-hmm. And and that's where I almost relish seeing someone uh, 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 like the establishment figures that are sort of poking their fingers in the eyes of Sanders supporters, saying, you, you, what you, "This is very cute and all, but it's never going to happen. It's never going to happen." And I, I welcome that. I mean, I really think that they're going to provoke a, an, a level of anger yeah. that will lead to more protests. And and I, you know, they're not going to forget the you know the, the the generation that is supporting you know uh, Sanders, largely younger generation, but not not only. But they're not going to forget these arguments no. that the establishment is making, mm-hmm. and they're going to continue voting. I mean, they're coming into their own right now mm-hmm. in terms of political power. Um, so I think we're on the cusp of seeing something. 
pretty yeah, large. Yeah, I think I think major. I think the oper- the moment has never been better. <laughs> you know, I've been you know I have someone who's self described as a socialist for the last ten years. You know, since I was sixteen years old. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I've considered myself a socialist, and there has never been a better moment uh, to be a socialist. Um, but I think people need to get it. They need to get it organized, and they need to get good politics. Mm-hmm. And that means meeting people. That means studying with them. Um, that means participating in movements as much as possible to the extent that they exist. Um, and t- f- opening up the spaces where you can have these kinds of conversations with your friends, with your neighbors, with your coworkers about, I think the world is crappy. <laughs> what can we do to make it less so? You mm-hmm. know, And then read something. Read some books or some mm-hmm. articles and discuss them. Um, and try and get your head around what it's actually going to take um, to to change the world. That's vital. Well, okay, tell me about that. I, we're running out of time here, but I had said I wanted to start the conversation with a little bit of biographical information, and if, now we're at the end. But <laughs> I, I am interested. How you know you said you were sixteen. 10 years ago, you came to the Socialist Party. What, uh, how did that happen? So I actually radicalized. Uh, I grew up in Kennebunk, Maine, uh, you know, which is, I think people who live there know is a very, um, can be a very challenging place to grow up as someone who um, doesn't necessarily have a ton of money uh, or, and, you know, has left or left-leaning politics. I think it's, mm. you know, the Bush compound is there. Um, a lot of the jobs that people work are, you know, service jobs with people, wealthy individuals from Massachusetts or New York, whoever coming up. It's a tourist town, you know. Um, so that was, you know, for me working, you know, working in the in the in Kennebunk Port and seeing that disparity, um, you know, was part of what drove me to radicalization. Um, you know, I became an anarchist, you know, basically at 16 was when I radicalized. Um, I broke with the Democratic Party after after John Kerry's, um, you know, basically terrible performance in 2004 Mm -hmm. uh, where he didn't even fight to end the war. Um, You know, so my first protest was at protest at the Bush compound against the war in Iraq. Mm -hmm. Um, I uh, put up a be right back sign at at the laundromat I worked at and I took off for like an hour (laughs) 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 and I somehow didn't get fired. (laughs) 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 Um, But you know that, so I radicalized as an anarchist, the reading Chomsky, Zen, that kind of thing. I moved to New York when I was uh, 18 and then uh, that's where I met the, the international socialist organization and uh yeah and i you know just it took again you know it was like a lot of argumentation a lot of figuring out like what is it going to take to 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 change the world and that's what won me to marxism um, do, well okay so do you have an elevator pitch for uh for people who have not yet been ra- radicalized but who maybe are a little uh disenchanted with the sh- system sure you know i think the thing to say is capitalism is failing us um capitalism is failing the people capitalism is failing the planet um, you know, capitalism, if we do not do something radical to change it, at the very least, um, we'll end the destruction, you know, we'll end our planet. Um, that's on the negative side. On the positive side, I just think we are human beings. We have built wonders um, ex- far exceeding the imagination of our ancestors, even going back 100 years. Um, the transformations in technology um, in society um, already have progressed so far, but they remain chained they remain chained to the interests of private of private profit uh, and to a handful of very very wealthy people um, and their hangers on. Uh, and if we unchain, you know, our relationship to society from that interest, from the interest of the tiny minority, and instead open it up to the democracy of millions of people, um, billions of people, <laughs> saying, "What do I want? What do I need?" Um, I think that that our lives could be, you know, just so beautiful. Um, I just think that there's so much beauty in this world, um, but it's 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 muted. Hmm. I think it's as good a place as any to uh, stop. My guest this evening has been Owen Hill, a uh, longtime activist and socialist. Keep an eye out for his writing. In uh, hopefully he'll reappear in Jacobin. He had a, an article recently. Congratulations on that, and uh, been published in the Socialist Worker as well. Uh, He's also currently the Portland branch organizer of the International Socialist Organization, which meets every Wednesday on the USM campus from 7 to 9. Where can people go to find out information about? Um, People can. uh, We have a Facebook page uh, that's um, still, you know, we're still in the starting phases of of getting organized. It's called USM Socialist slash Portland branch of the International Socialist Organization. You can like that page. Um, You know, if you're really interested, if you want to talk or something, you can always shoot me an email. I'm owen.t.hill at gmail.com. All right, great. Thanks so much for being here, Owen. This is a a, a fun conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Love to do it again. 